I'm Stephen Downing, and I'm very happy to be with you this morning. I was here about six months ago and shared with you about Redeemer Ministries. Now, there is a, a table at the back there which has some uh, material on it, Bibles, super giant print Bibles, large print, a variety there that might suit you. There's some children's Bibles there as well some colouring in for children and there's a Thompson Chain reference Bible there a magnificent uh, presentation which is the famous study Bible they retail at $100 and we're able to do them for $60 so you may have a, like to have a look at that Chain reference Bible it's there at the back now I've got some photos to show you to bring you just a, a little bit up to date with uh, Redeemer Ministries. So let's have this first photo, shall we? Because we're working in the brick kilns of Pakistan and uh, there are 20,000 brick kilns in Pakistan. There's about 100 people in a brick kiln and they work from 4am until dusk seven days a week they don't get any breaks and they're slaves so we'll just take this first photo shall we and just give you a bit of an idea of uh, what, it, what it means <coughs> uh, the government of Pakistan knows about the big killing people but does nothing about them. The religion of Pakistan knows about the big killing people and does nothing about them. The only people that visit them are Christian pastors in Pakistan. This of course was the first time I ever met anyone in the big kilns when I was taken to see them. And uh, they've got to do 600 bricks per day, each individual person. And if they don't get the quota, then that just gets added on to their debt. They're there because of their debt. So the brick kiln owner comes to them and says, I'll pay your debt. You come and work for me, and you can pay off your debt that way. The trouble is they get two dollars per day and they're never able to pay their debt. For example, this man here, he may have been born in the brick kiln, so he may have been there for over 40 years. So we've been able to redeem, that is, release these families by paying their debt and bringing them back into the community to live normal lives. Now, it might have cost us two and a half thousand to release this family, but in the last two years and four months, we've been able to release 101 families in that period. I think the last time I was here, it was about 40 families. Since that time, it's now 101 families. And there's a further five or six families recently presented to us. So it's a growing work and it's a blessed work and we're able to pay the debts of these families and get them released from slavery. The next one to show you in this. Now the thing about the brick kilns as well as the slavery, there's also this very poor interest in children. So there's no education, nothing at all to help them, no interest by the government or the religion of Pakistan to do something about the children. So we decided that we would try to start some Christian schools. And this would have been amongst one of the first Christian schools that we started in Pakistan, brick kilns. Now they're as basic as that, a mat, no desks, no chairs, a 
very simple situation of giving them an education, one teacher who covers this range of age groups, she can do that because of the, the way uh, the, the books are produced and the children learn at their own pace. And uh, so this is one of the schools. Now, at the moment, we've got 37 Christian schools in the Brick Hills and another four Christian schools to start in the next week or so. So that's an extremely good story about the children. Now, uh, the thing about these girls, when they reach nine years of age or 10 years of age, they could be kidnapped, abducted, abused, raped, forced into an Islamic marriage and have children against their will and become the fourth wife of an Islamic marriage. So this is a really, really serious problem in Pakistan and it's right throughout the country. Many of them have tried to escape from this type of bondage. It's another form of slavery, of course. And we've been able to set up a program to help these women who do escape and teach them how to read and write and how to sew and how to start their own business so they never again be holden to that kind of bondage. So look, I really believe that What's going on here amongst the children in the brick kilns is a very, very important thing to do. Then the next one to show you. Well, the other thing about the brick kilns is there's no medical care. Hard to believe, isn't it? 20,000 brick kilns. No doctors, no nurses, no medicine, no painkillers. People just have to put up with what happens to them. And I meet many, many people with all sorts of illnesses and sicknesses uh, while I was there. So we thought what a wonderful thing it would be if we could provide a mobile medical van that would go around the brick kilns and minister to the physical and medical needs of the people. And that is what has been happening. Well, right now there are four mobile medical vans. I wonder what it means when people see this van. It goes through the suburbs of Lahore in Pakistan, out to the Brick Hills. Free medical camp for slave brick kiln people. That's what happens. I wonder what sort of message that must leave to the people in Pakistan. And this particular van is sponsored by Susan and Bruce, who are in Victoria. Now the next one to show you. One of the things that we find in missionary work, it can be very, very challenging to fit into the culture in which uh, you're living dietary habits, some of the things that are particular, peculiar to a, a country. In Pakistan, the women of Pakistan find it really difficult to go to a male doctor or to a male nurse. Here's a lineup of about 30 Pakistan women. They're lining up to be helped through the medical work of the van. And so we found out fairly quickly that we needed to provide female doctors and nurses. And that is what has taken place. And they're the sort of challenges that come with missionary uh, work and endeavor. And then the next one, well, here we have the missionaries and the doctors, samples of the, the medicine. It costs $2,000 per year to fill up a van with medicine. And I think the last one, I think uh, that this is just a, a young family that we've been able to redeem and the work that we give them when they go into the community. Well, thank you that I was able to share that with you and uh, appreciate 
the way of support of Redeemer Ministries in the time together. Now I'm going to share with you from 1 Thessalonians and I've just got a couple of photos to show you to give you a bit of background to what I'll be talking about in this chapter, these chapters in the New Testament. So 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapters 1 to 5, I'm not going to go through every verse, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview, a bit of impression of what the Apostle Paul is trying to say in these chapters. And the next one to show you. Now this is Thessalonica. The reason why I took this photo is because it's where the old synagogue used to be. Just here. Paul used to always visit the Jewish people in the synagogue. And he would have done that in Thessalonica in this particular area. Now it got burnt down. So this is just a modern building that has replaced it. The next one to show you. And this is a, a photo that shows the old ruins of Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul would have known about those, that place here was called the Public Forum. And there are the modern buildings that are on the outside of the Forum. Now the Forum was known as a Public Forum. Remember, no mobile phones, no microphones, no newspapers. So every city used to have a Public Forum where announcements were made and public things took place markets took place. Sometimes I would even have a chariot race in the public forum. This is a fairly small one. This is where the Apostle Paul would have been for three weekends because he came to Thessalonica with a missionary team and they had a great time of ministry. A lot of people got converted and so uh, it was a tremendous blessing uh, in Thessalonica. Now the next one to show you, this is a bit of artwork. It's known as the Jewish menorah and it's the artwork of the Jewish menorah and the reason why it's there is as a memorial to the fact that so many Jewish people got persecuted. They lost their lives to Islam. Islam persecuted the Jewish people, and the Jewish people persecuted the Christians, and Islam persecuted the Jewish people and the Christians. And so Thessalonica it was very, very common for them to suffer for their faith. That's why that memorial there is, because the Jews suffered as well. And then the last one to show you, this is the port of Thessalonica. This is where Paul and the missionary team would have come in, into this port. Now the reason why I wanted to show you this photo is that tower. That tower was known as the Tower of Blood. It used to be painted red. And when the Ottoman Empire took over Greece, the Islamic people used to take Christians, Christian young men, like 17, 18 years of age, snatch them from their homes and put them in that tower and that's where they were executed. And so when Greece got back their country, they decided to leave the tower there and they painted it white. And it was always there to stand as a memorial of how Greece had suffered when they were under the, the banner of the Ottoman Empire. So Thessalonica is a lot about suffering, a lot about persecution, and a lot about Christian people finding it hard to follow their faith. So Paul had to get out of Thessalonica 
because it became so hostile for him to be there. And when he left this Malachi, he ended up in Athens, and he kept saying to himself, I wonder how that church is going. Just this, this young church. I wonder how they're coping. And that's what chapter 3 is about in 1 Thessalonians. Chapters 1 to 5. Just have a look at chapter 3. This one. So when he could stand it no longer, that's just a tremendous expression, isn't it, of how he's feeling. When we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy. Now that's interesting. Timothy's about 18, 19 years of age. A young man. He was sent by Paul to go back to Thessalonica to find out how they're going. It's a tremendous investment in a young man, a young Christian man. And I really like the idea of the way um, there is this indication by the church of investing in young people. We sent Timothy who is our brother and God's fellow servant in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. So it was part and parcel of being in Thessalonica. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. So he's really concerned about how they're going with the Lord, how they're standing up, and how they're holding on to their faith. So he sends Timothy, now verse 6, But Timothy has now just come to us from you, and he has brought us good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us, and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really lived since you are standing firm in the Lord. Well, that was a great encouragement to Paul because Timothy came back to see they're doing well. They're being faithful, they're strong in the Lord, and they're standing firm. They're standing strong in the Lord's strength. Now maybe there's a little bit of a word there for Port Stephens Church of Christ. It hasn't been the easiest of time in recent months and years. But here is a word to us that just reminds us of the people who held on to their faith who were committed to their faith and committed to the Lord even through some fairly difficult trials. We've stood firm in the Lord. Now furthermore, uh, in chapter 1, Paul makes the point after receiving this news, chapter 1 and verse 8, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. So 
So Paul heard not only about their faith and their love, but about their commitment. They were no longer serving the pagan gods of greed and of corruption and immorality and all of those, that type of uh, lifestyle which was very much a part of Thessalonica. They turned their back on that to serve the true living God. And even though that meant some sacrifices, they made the decision that it was better to serve the true God, the living God, than to serve the sort of lifestyle, the sort of gods of the world who did not give them meaning and the satisfaction and the peace that they were looking for. I've been very interested uh, in the past month or so about uh, the life of Shane Warne, the cricketer, who died on a Tuesday night about a month ago, 6 p.m. on a Tuesday. And it was a terrible shock to us all. People wrote about him, said how he was such a good friend, how generous he was, how talented he was. And so many people, reams and reams of print about his generosity. And all of that was there. And, but there was one little spot in the Sydney Morning Herald and it was from Kerry O'Keefe, who was a former cricketer and also a commentator, who knew Shane Warne very well. And he said, you know, the thing about Shane Warne, he was always looking for peace. I was very struck by that because he was worth about $50 million. He could do anything at all that he liked, and he did. And it really sort of brought home to me how that you can have these things and you can have this ability to do whatever you like, but you're still looking for peace. And it's that peace that makes all the difference to the meaning of life. Amen. So, First um, Thessalonians is just bring giving thanks to God for the people who had really shunned that sort of lifestyle and had turned to the living God. One of the reasons why they were people like this, in chapter 2 and verse 13 it says, we give thanks to God because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it as the word of, not of the, as the word of men, but what it actually is, the word of God. It was a church that really welcomed the Bible. It was a church that really embraced Bible teaching. It was not a church just simply for feeling nice or feeling good or even some sort of entertainment. It was a church that really responded to God's word. And not so much to the personality of the person that was perhaps the pastor of the church, or how charming he was, or how personable he was, and all of those things are very good. But no, the strength of the church was the way they accepted the Bible as God's word. And that was one of the reasons why it was such a good church. And it was a good church. It was a great church. But it had a couple of problems. And one of those is mentioned in chapter 4. And it's sort of not sort of highlighted too much, except it says in chapter 4, verse 11, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, 
and to work with your hands just as we told you to. What was happening in that church of Thessalonica, they really embraced the teaching of the second coming. But there were those in the church who said, well, if that's the case, we won't have to work anymore. We can just live life each day as we want because the Lord is coming back soon. Now, Paul made it clear we all believe in the coming back of the Lord, but we go to work on Monday morning to provide for our families and to provide for the needs that we have in daily life. So, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Christians are expected to work, to do their job. If they're handicapped, if they've been made redundant, if through some reason or other they cannot work, that's understandable. But in a general principle, Christians are expected to work and to do their job. So that was the first problem. Now the other problem was, and it's, it's mentioned in chapter 4 again, and it starts in verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. What happens to those who are Christians and then they die? We do not want you to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we are still, we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, a couple of difficulties, some disputes which were addressed by good, clear, biblical teaching. And it makes a big difference when we're able to deal with our issues by following the scripture as we see it. Now the last point to make is in chapter 5. And this is to do with, well, now that we have these things, now that we are a church, now that we know where we're going, how then should we live? And that's chapter 5 and verse uh, 13, is it? Chapter 5 and verse 12. It is verse 13, just the second part of verse 13. Live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. There it is again. It was a real issue in the Thessalonican church. Warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Look after those who are not sure. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Do you know one of the greatest gifts we can give to each other is to listen to each other? It's one of the greatest gifts we can give to our wife and our husband is to actually listen to what they're saying. The greatest gift we can give to our neighbour is to listen to them. And it's true in the church. For as we listen to each other, then we will understand 
what's going on. And not until that takes place we will, we will, we will have any true comprehension of what the problem is. So listening, very, very important. So be patient with each other. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. It's a delicious thing to get revenge sometimes, but the Lord asks us to keep away from that. He'll look after that. Always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. And this is not a fake happiness. This is not like always being on stage, always having to perform. We don't always have to be performing joyfully and being happy. No, this is a deep-seated joy that is there whatever we're going through. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you. So th there is a clear direction about it. What is God's will for me? It is to give thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. That's an interesting one for us, isn't it? Because uh, you know, we're in a bit of a rebuilding stage at the moment, aren't we? We're sort of rebuilding from where we've been. Rebuild, rebuilding community, rebuilding fellowship, rebuilding, re rebuilding the, the, the blessing of the Spirit on, on our church. All of those things are very very important at the moment. And so here it is telling us not to quench or not to put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Well, that's a challenge too, isn't it? It's so easy just to leave things hope they'll work out. But it's beholden upon us to test what has been said, to test what we've been asked to do, to test what we're told the Bible says. In everything, we are called upon to test the things that are there. Because Christian people are meant to be alert Test everything, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. How then should we live? Here it is right here in this chapter. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called How Then Should We Live? And look, it's, um, it's a very powerful statement. So that what happens for us in church is we, we kind of reset Every time we're in the fellowship of the Lord, we, we sort of reset at this point, reset at that place, reshape ourselves to better do God's will and be in that place where we're more open to the Spirit's calling on our life. Amen. Let's have a prayer, shall we? Thank you for the way your Holy Spirit has been ministering to us. And in all circumstances, Lord, we have been aware of ways in which we can be more open to your Holy Spirit, more open to your guidance, more open to your direction, Lord, and to surrender much more to your will and to your purpose. That we might be a people, that we might be a church, that we might be a man, a woman of God, that we might
might be people more who really do bless you and please you and love you. So we ask for your strength to do these things. Lord, we ask for your wisdom to go about our life and the challenges that we face in our family, in our community, and Lord, in our church. Pray, Lord, that we'll be able to do things in the right way, in the best way, that will be honouring to you. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. to come together as God's children to worship Him, to thank Him, and to learn from Him. You know, this morning we've had a reading from Psalm, to start off with, and reading again from Psalm. I'm not going to read from Psalm 2 this morning. An old missionary friend of mine, lady, gone round the meet of the Lord a long time ago. Now, <clears throat> she said, John, read a psalm every day. I was only a reasonably young Christian in those days. He said, the psalms are full of praise to God. The psalms are good for teaching and to learn from an experience of what the psalmist went through. He says, still have your devotion read a psalm every day. I haven't, must admit I haven't done it every day, but I try to read a psalm. And you know, it does your heart good. It draws you closer in relationship to the Lord Jesus and all you've done for us. So this morning, I'm going to read from a few different psalms. I'm reading a psalm from the NIV translation. <coughs> Psalm 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, His love endures forever. This psalm wholly devoted to the phrase of God's great love, In each of the 26 verses of this psalm, we have this expression, His love endures forever. The psalmist was full of the glad thoughts. Our heart should be filled with a blessed assurance that His love endures forever. The everlasting, the unchangeable love of God is cause for unceasing praise and thanksgiving. In Psalm 103 verse 4 we read, Who redeemed your life from the pit and crowned you with love and compassion. Verse 8, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. As wonderful as our God's greatness is, so is it infinite, is his love. Verse 11 says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love to those who fear him. Verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgression from us. <coughs> what a thought. As high as the heavens above the earth, as far as the east is from the west, it is so immeasurable, inconceivable. Great is the love of God waiting to bestow his richest blessing upon us. <coughs> Little story about the east from the west. I think I might have shared it once before, I'm not sure. I was in a mission, working away there, and I was helping an old Aboriginal brother. 
and all beat up old Holden, car, and his clutch is burned out of it. And I was helping to put a new one in. We're down in the pit at the mission, amongst all the dirt on the floor and grease and stuff. I put the clutch in, lined it all up, and I couldn't get that gear off to go back in. I tried and I tried and I tried. And those who have done anything like that, you've got a gearbox above your head. Oh, boy, did you aren't they? Anyway, I put it down. I said, fuck you to the Lord. Lord, have I got to say something to Mick, that's his name, to sell that little brother? Or is he going to say something to me? So when I saw him get my breath back to have another go, Mick said to me, brother, and he spoke very slowly, got a big problem. He had a son who took epileptic fits, and he was a real handful for him and his wife. And I'd seen him Mick many times take a fit. I thought he was talking about his brother Mick, son Mick, I should say. <coughs> He said, brother, big problem. And I said, you talk to the Lord about it, Mick? Yeah, yeah. What's the big problem, Mick? Oh, he said, long time ago. What's the problem, Mick? He said, oh, brother, big problem. He'd been in the army, and when they bombed down, when they bombed Darwin, he went bush. But out of the place. Gee, that's, I don't know, it was a little tackle when that happened. What's the problem, Mick? He said, I ran away. I said, you tell the Lord? Yeah. Well, what have I got to say? And this verse comes to me. I said, Mick, where did the sun get up this morning? Point to the east. I said, where are you going to sleep? Point to the west. I said, did you ever catch him? You keep the old west, do you catch up with him? No. What about tomorrow? You catch him? No. I said, that's how far God has forgiven you. And he was silent. Then he said, true, brother. True. I said, yeah. God has forgiven you as far as the east is from the west. I said, God will tell you that. Quiet, and he said, praise the Lord. And I said, trouble now, me? No, he said, big trouble go on. Lord know about it. We had a little prayer together in the car, in the pit, and he was a different man. You know, some of us are like that. We say we tell the Lord about our problem, but it still stays on that shoulder. As high as the heavens above the earth, so great is God's love to each one of us. Far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. <coughs> and you know, the end of the story, I picked up that gearbox and it almost fell in. <laughs> And the most exciting part about it was my brother realised that God had moved away. <clears throat> Verse 17 of our reading says, But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord loves those who fear him. Here again, the psalmist speaks of God's boundless loving kindness. How often we read these familiar words without the least thought of the immeasurable greatness of them. We need to be still and to meditate, and then respond in the words of Psalm 36, 5 says, Your love, your love, O Lord, reaches to heaven. Your faithfulness to the sky. Verse 7 says, How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among people find refuge in the shadow of your wings. 
Verse 10 says, Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness, your righteousness, the upright in heart. May we take time to thank the Lord Jesus for his great joy and his great love, which he has crowned us with, and we know him as our Lord and Saviour. In Psalm 63, verse 3 and 4 says, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. I will praise you as long as I live. Let's just be quiet for a few seconds and thank the Lord before we take communion for his great love to us, for his word, for the Holy Spirit that is within us. We be drawn closer to him and give him all the glory to his name. Let's just spend this time together. <coughs> precious blood, never to be shed again. And we thank you, Father, too, for the lovely promises of your word. We do this until we see you, when we are face to face with our Lord Jesus to share with his glory. Father, we have so much to thank and praise you for. And this morning, Lord, as we take these elements, bread, Remind us afresh of that body that was perfect. Then, Father, you took our sin, my sin, and placed it on your son. For the precious shed blood, we give thanks for this cup, asking your blessing in our Saviour's name. we hold in our hand. Father, we take it in remembrance of the precious shed blood you shed for us. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 